welcome to the Knox County Public Library's tutor team. My name is Mr. Frederick and today I will be tutoring grades 4 and 5 in English Language Arts. Our topic today is going to be all about the author's purpose. Now, what exactly is an author's purpose? Well, we're going to find out. So, welcome to Author's Purpose. Welcome to my Pi Ed class. Young chefs. Now, the reason we're saying pie ed is because a lot of times we can use the word pie to help us figure out what our author's purpose is going to be. So, today I will share my five delectable flavors of author's purpose pie. First, let's discuss what author's purpose is it's the reason an author writes something a story, a book, a magazine, an article, anything. So, it's why are they writing that? You have to ask yourself. Why, why would they write this story? What are they trying to do? The reason an author writes something... So, let me share with you a recipe of reasons an author might write something. Because you may ask yourself, so, hmm, I'm an author. I'm trying to come up with a story. I need a reason to write this story. So what's that reason going to be? Well... There's a recipe of reasons. You could be writing it to persuade someone to do something. So, for example, if you want someone to try a new restaurant and you're a writer, you may be writing a review of that restaurant and convincing people to go to this place or a reason not to go to that place. It may be informing you. Maybe you're researching some kind of topic and you want to write about it. You're going to give them facts and information and inform them. It could be entertain, which means it's just a fun story. You just want to make somebody laugh or have fun. It could be explaining. So you're explaining why something happens or the way it is. Or it could be describing. Describing means to really go into detail about a certain thing. You're talking about the color, the shape, the texture. You're using lots of adjectives and details. So let's look at each of the ingredients of this recipe really closely. Persuade. Remember, inform entertain, explain, and describe. So the author's purpose might be to persuade. We've kind of talked a little bit about that. The author might want to convince the reader of something. Vanilla cupcakes are better than chocolate cupcakes. Now, I don't agree with that one, so they're going to have a hard time convincing me of what that is. But if they're trying to persuade you, they're going to give you reasons and evidence why that vanilla cupcake is going to be better than chocolate cupcakes. Or advertisements. They can be persuasive. Companies are trying to convince you to buy their product or service. So like buy now. You've seen it on TV. Like they have the sham wow or something like that where they're really trying to get you to buy that product because it's supposed to be the best and it's supposed to do something really great and then you get it home and half the time it doesn't work. But in this case, they may be trying to convince you to buy or sell something. Um, let me co cook up an example for you of something written to persuade. So... Let's pay attention to this story. I'm going to move myself down out of the way a little bit. Children in elementary school should participate in a PE class every day for several reasons. First, many children today go home after school and play video games or watch TV. Physical education class may be the only time of day that children are physically active. Another reason schools should provide a daily PE class is that many children eat too much junk food and are overweight. They need more physical activity. Finally, research shows that students who are more physically active perform better at school. Physical activity improves focus and concentration in the classroom. We need to change our school's schedules so that children have PE each and every day. And I'm going to move myself back in the back corner here. Now, not everybody's going to agree with that. But they're trying to convince you of why this needs to happen. Why we need PE in class every single day. My kids would probably agree with that at school. So, the author's purpose might be to inform. And if you remember what we talked about, that means the author might want to give the reader some type of information. It could be news, it could be anything. Uh, textbooks and most are in most nonfiction books are written to inform you. So, like your social studies textbook is to inform you about the history of events that have happened to make our country what it is today. I have cook. I have, love cooking up examples. Here's an example of something written with the purpose to inform. Doctors are well educated. 
They attend school and receive special training for many years before becoming a licensed physician. Students hoping to become a doctor begin by going to college for four years. They must earn a four-year degree, and they usually focus on an area of science. During their last year of college, they apply for medical school. Only about half of the students who apply for medical schools get accepted. Medical school lasts four years. During the first two years, students spend most of their time in classrooms and laboratories. During the last two years, students also work with physicians and watch them care for patients. Once medical school is complete, potential doctors complete a one-year residency program. Residents receive on-the-job training as they work full-time and get paid for the first time. Following the residency program, potential doctors complete an internship in the area they hope to specialize. Internships vary in length, depending on the area of specialty. A person who attends to be a family doctor is typically an intern for two or three years, while a person who strives to be a surgeon interns for five years or more. The final requirement to becoming a doctor is passing one or more exams to become fully licensed. Clearly, doctors are dedicated, well-educated professionals. So, I learned something there. I learned about how much schooling doctors have to have. It's giving you lots of facts and information about what a doctor has to go through to become a fully licensed doctor for surgery or just a family doctor. So, this one's to inform you. The next one is to entertain. So the author might want to give the reader something to enjoy reading. Fiction books are usually written to entertain. I hope you're finding my examples to be tasty. Here's an example of something written with the purpose to entertain. Brayden was feeling excited and nervous at the same time. He was heading to summer camp for the first time in his life. His cousin Michael, who had gone to camp last summer, had talked about it all year long. Braden had been begging his parents to let him go to the camp this summer ever since Christmas. Braden had told his parents that all he wanted for Christmas was to go to summer camp. What parent could say no to that wish? And as they walked toward the camp entrance, Braden realized his mom was talking to him. Now, Braden, remember to shower and wear deodorant every day, she was saying. Mom, shh, someone might hear you, hissed Braden. So that one was to entertain because it's kind of a funny story, you know. His mom reminded him to wear deodorant or do something like that. It makes you kind of laugh a little bit. So that one was to entertain you. It's just a fun little story. The next one might be to explain. Now, the author might want to tell you how something works or how to do something. I must admit, this one's my favorite. I write recipes all the time to explain how to make things. Here's an example of something written with the purpose to explain. So if you think about it, it's kind of like a how-to text. And that's what the chef does. The chef writes recipes. They tell you how to make a certain thing. So let's go on. Have you ever wanted to study your own fingerprints? Here's what you need to do. First, get your supplies. You will need a pencil, an index card, and clear tape. Now you are ready to begin. Use a soft pencil to color a square patch on a piece of paper about the size of your finger. Rub your finger in the graph, on the graphite of the paper, also rocking it side to side, and next take a small piece of tape and wrap it around your fingertip. Finally, remove the tape from your finger and tape it to an index card. You can now see your fingerprint. So basically they're saying to take pencil, right, rub it all over your finger, put it on a piece of tape, and then put it on an index card, and you should be able to see your fingerprint. That's a pretty cool how-to. The author's purpose might be to describe something. So the author might want to help you see or experience a person, a place, or a thing. The author often tries to help you imagine things using your five senses. And if you remember, that's like your sense of taste, your sense of smell, what you see, what you hear, what you feel. The author describes, so we just talked about that. Um, so I'm cooking up my last example for you. Close your eyes to understand how the senses are employed in this example of something written with a purpose to describe. Mmm, the heavenly aroma of chocolate chip cookies fresh out of the oven is like no other smell in the world. As I sink my teeth into the soft center, warm chocolate oozes onto my tongue. Its sweet taste tantalizes my taste buds. The sight of chocolate chip cookies makes my heart beat faster in anticipation. If I could eat a chocolate chip cookie each day of my life, I would be one very happy kid. 
You, you see how they use those words like the heavenly aroma and as I sink my teeth into the soft center, they're using those describing words so I can really kind of picture in my head what that cookie smells like and tastes like. Sounds really good to me. I'm kind of hungry. So, are you ready for a taste test, young chefs? We're going to practice and see if we can figure out what some of these are. I will serve you a passage, and you tell me what the author's purpose is for writing it. So Gaylord Nelson is the person credited for Earth Day. He was convinced that the planet was at risk, so he decided to try to do something to change that. He was elected to the U.S. Senate in 1962. He came up with an idea for Earth Day and announced the concept at a conference he was attending in Seattle in the fall of 1969. Citizens from all over the United States responded to his call by the following April. Americans were ready. The first Earth Day took place on April 22, 1970. 20 million people participated. Thousands of schools and communities got involved. Earth Day celebrations have flourished since that first one in 1970. There is now an Earth Day Network, a nonprofit group that organizes Earth Day activities. In 1990, Earth Day went global when 140 countries participated. Earth Day is now an important day in April. People everywhere are uniting to take care of our planet. So think about that passage. I really want you to think, what is it trying to do? Is it trying to persuade me about something? Is it informing me? Is it explaining? Is it entertaining? Or is it describing? So, what was the author's purpose for that? Well, it was to inform you, the reader, about how Earth Day came to be. It was giving you information. It was giving you facts to help you understand how Earth Day got started and where it is now. I mean, because we still celebrate it every year at school, right? So that is informing. Brooke dragged herself into the kitchen. Ugh, I just want to go back to bed, she thought. She wished it was the weekend, but she knew it was only Thursday. She had to be at school in 45 minutes. I better start on breakfast. So Brooke glanced at the counter as she opened the refrigerator. What in the world? She thought to herself. She rubbed her eyes and looked again. Yes, she saw the same thing. Purple eggs and green milk. Are my eyes working correctly? April Fools, giggled her mother, who was watching from the other room. Brooke smiled. That was a good one, Mom. Her mom knew that Brooke loved this quirky day of the year. So think about this. Was this story persuading you to buy anything? Was it informing you? Was it entertaining you? Was it trying to explain something to you? Or was it just describing? Think about it. Are there any clues in there? Oh, it's just to entertain you. It was just a funny little story about April Fool's Day and a girl who had a joke played on her by her mom, right? So it was to entertain you. All right, if you have a lot of extra crayon stubs laying around, don't throw them out. You can use them to make big, chunky crayons. Just follow these steps. One, collect all of your old crayons. Two, remove the paper wrapped around the crayons. Three, cut them into small pieces. Four, preheat the oven to 250 degrees. Five, fill a muffin tin one inch thick with the crayon pieces. Bake for 15 to 20 minutes or until the crayons are melted. Allow the tin to cool. And then pop out the crayons and start coloring. So this one should be a little bit easier to figure out. Is it persuading you? Is it informing you? Is it entertaining, explaining, or describing? You should have guessed... It's to explain. It's to explain how the reader made those crayons. It was like a how-to. Remember, explaining is like a how-to. It gave you step-by-step -step directions on how to make something so that it's explained. Dear Kate, I wish you were here at the beach with me. You would love it. Last night, I sat on the beach as the sun was setting. I could feel the warm breeze while I would listen to the calming, rhythmic crashing of the waves against the shore. The colors of the sunset was simply beautiful. The sky had layers of red, orange, yellow, blue, violet, and magenta. It was incredible. I took a deep breath and the feeling of fresh air filling my lungs. The only thing that would have made this experience better is if you would have been here to see it with me. See you soon. Say hi to mom and dad for me. Your sister, Jessica. So think about this story. Lots of color words in here. Lots of just like words to talk about the waves and what you see in here. So this one should have been 
describing. It was describing the read to the reader the wonderful experience of being at the beach. Oh, I could be at the beach right now. I miss that place. I didn't get to go this year. Um, next one. Many people think brown is a boring color, but I disagree. Brown is the best color of all. It is the color of teddy bears. And don't most young children go to bed with a teddy bear? Brown can give us a feeling of comfort. Brown is also the color of chocolate. Everyone loves chocolate. It's the perfect thing to make you feel better after a rough day. Don't you agree that brown is one of the best colors? So we've only got a few left we haven't used, so we need to think. Is this persuading you to do something or think something? Is it informing you? Entertaining you? Is it explaining or is it describing? If we talk about this one, you should have said... Dun, dun, dun. persuading you. It was trying to get you to agree with her that brown was a one of the best colors in the world. I'm not sure she persuaded me, but I get what she's saying. Everybody teach their own, right? Now, we're going to practice just a couple of these. Now let's practice with some passages and multiple choice questions. So, according to Laura Wattenberg, author of The Baby Name Wizard, we are in the middle of a naming revolution. Never before has there been such a variety of names given to newborns. In the 1950s, half of all male babies born were given one of 25 common boy names, while half of all female babies were born were given one of common 30 names, I believe. That is by no means the case today, however. According to Wattenberg, if you have 10 guesses to get somebody's name today, there's almost no chance you'll get it. But 100 years ago, if you guessed the top 10 names, you would have a really good chance of guessing correctly. What's the reason for the change? Well, sociologists suggest that parents are striving to give their children a name that will be unique and distinctive. Traits that are becoming increasingly prized in the world today. So... What was the author's purpose in writing this passage? To persuade the reader to agree that babies should be given unique names? To inform the reader about how baby naming has changed in recent years? To inform the reader about the importance of choosing a good name for your baby? Or to entertain the reader with facts about baby names? Now, was it trying to get you to think a certain way? No, I wouldn't think so. So that leaves you, that one can be taken out. So now we have three left. Which one did you choose? You should have chose to inform. It was, and I know there's two informs, but it's not really talking about the importance of choosing a good name. It's why the names changed in recent years. You're using those clues and information from the story, talking about why 10, 100 years ago you would have been able to probably pick somebody's name because they only had a few common names. Last story today. I'm going to have a baby sister in a few months, and I think my parents should name her Amelia. I think it's the right name for several reasons. First, Amelia means to work, industrious, or laborious. I think that will inspire her to be a hard worker and never give up. Secondly, I know of at least two famous and inspiring women with the name Amelia. Amelia Earhart was the first female pilot to attempt to fly solo around the world. Even though she mysteriously disappeared attempting to do so, she was clearly a fearless and determined person. Amelia Boynton Robinson was also fearless and determined. She was a 1960s civil rights activist who championed the African-American right to vote and was even brutally beaten as she bravely fought for this cause. If I were a girl, I would be honored to share a name with either of these famous women. Wouldn't you? Clearly, my parents should name my baby sister Amelia. Now think about this. Was this to entertain the reader with a story of how his or her, her baby sister got her name? To inform the reader of famous Amelias of the past century? To persuade the reader to agree that his parents should choose Amelia for his baby sister's name? Or to persuade the reader to agree that Amelia means to work industrious or laborious? So think about it. What were they trying to do? And the answer is C. They were trying to persuade the reader to agree that his parents should choose the name Amelia. He was giving all the great Amelias of the past and the world and why it was a good name. So he was trying to convince them that that was the best choice. Well, that concludes our lesson for today. If you would like to watch this video or any other Knox County Public Library Tutor Team video, go to YouTube and search KCPL Tutor Team and you should find us.
All right, until next week, I'm Mr. Frederick, and thank you. 